it's really great to, uh, to be here. Uh, I, uh, my first trip to Spokane was in 1993 to come to the, what was then known as the Northwest Mining Association. And uh, I had the pleasure of giving a presentation, I'll never forget it, it was the ABCs of Project Finance. And uh, it, from there I uh, ended up coming back to work for a company and I've lived here now for 20 years. So it's, I'm particularly happy to uh, be able to make the, the uh, be the keynote speaker today. Um, and Joe, thanks very much for the introduction. And Laura, uh, thanks very much for the award. Uh, I, I had no idea that we were receiving an award and very much appreciate that. Um, now I hope everyone's had the opportunity to download the app. And this presentation is gonna be a little bit different than most because unlike most, you don't need to surreptitiously have your phone. You can just have it right out there <laughs> because I don't know that you're not looking at the presentation because the presentation is actually going to be on your phone. So you have the, uh, uh, the ability to be texting and doing all sorts of other business while, we're, uh, while I'm presenting. Uh, but you also have the opportunity to participate in some surveys. And these are, these are fun little surveys, but uh, part of the message that we want to send by having the, this app and doing something that's a little different is the thinking that we have at Heckler Mining Company that we've got to change, we've got to innovate, we've got to take advantage of the technologies that are, that are out there. So this is new for us. If the thing doesn't work right, that's okay because that's what happens when you're trying new things. You're gonna have stuff that's not gonna work, it's gonna, it's gonna fail. Now the only thing I would ask is that you turn off the ringer on your phone because I've got all this stuff I'm supposed to be doing up here and I'll get all whacked out if, you, uh, if your phone starts ringing. So we're going to start with, uh, and Vicki is going to, Vicki Veltkamp, a longtime Heckler employee, is, has helped me with the speech. She is, uh, Vicki is uh, retired about seven years ago. Uh, and thank you so much, Vicki, for the help on this. So. Um, we're going to start th with a survey. Uh, the first is how many of you have ever Googled yourself? So look at your phone, put your answer on your phone, and Vicki, when there's enough votes, or she will try to put it up on that slide. And we'll see if this, oh, there it is. Well, look at that. 77% of you have had the, uh, I guess, or I don't know how to describe it, self-absorbed that you... <laughs> <laughs> no, look, it's changing, 81%, look at that. Okay, second question, second question. Have you ever Googled what year, have you ever Googled what happened in the year of your birth? So that's the next question. So let's see if anybody's done that. No, and the choices are A, or B. <laughs> well, look at that. Not very many people have figured out what happened the year of their birth. Well, we wanted to know what happened the year Hecla Mining Company started. Um, so, um, when, when we started thinking about this presentation, we started to look back in the history, and the history, three things really came out in the history. One was persistence, the second was perspective, and the third was position. I skipped ahead, Vicki. <laughs> All contributing to Hecla's longevity, and those have really become our theme words for this celebratory year. And if you, you know, you can't help but come into this, this luncheon and, be hit by those three words because we got it on the screen, it's on the, at your table, on those, those little brochures that we've handed out. Um, that really though, though does describe, we think, Hecla Mining Company. And, and uh, so now let's look at what happened to Hecla, what happened in the world in 1891. And it was a remarkable, inventive and productive year with lots of firsts in some ways that immensely changed everyone's lives. 
And so I'm going to start with a few incidents. First, the scoundrels. The first great train robbery by the Dalton gang. Now, Western movies are based on guys like the Daltons. Um, and interestingly enough, they actually botched the whole thing. They, the train robbery did not go well at all. But they did show persistence and, and, and this life of, of crime, for their life of crime, and they became very famous. Now, the Hormel Company was formed and eventually introduced the world to spam. Now, for you, you know, non, for you millennials, or whatever that comes after millennials, spam is a food, not an internet word. <laughs> now, the first gasoline-powered car um, debuted in Springfield, Massachusetts, just shortly before the first ever basketball game was played in that same city. And Thomas Edison, who was the Steve Jobs of his day, on December 29th, he patented radio signals. And as I just learned uh, over the weekend, uh, you know, I guess the weekend, people, some people call it Thanksgiving, I call it football weekend, because that's about all we did was watch football. Um, I found out that the Army-Navy game, the most iconic game, football game in, ever, was started in 1891. So this is just a fraction of the things that happened in an incredible year of innovation, new business, and new ideas. And stepping right into this exciting year was Hecla Mining Company, the men created it that year. And a birthday, and especially a Quasqua Centennial, did I get that right? Okay. That's what the 125th anniversary is called, a Quasqua Centennial. And that's, so that's your new word for the day, and I doubt you will ever use it again. <laughs> anyway, this is an occasion to look back and compare what we're doing today and think about the future. We're going to talk about the past, the present, and the future, and how I view the, our industry moving forward, uh, given our particular and unique experience of our uh, persistence, perspective, and position. So Hecla was incorporated in 1891, and as, the, uh, and as, as such, we are the oldest precious metals company in North America. But the origins of the company actually started in 1885 with a mining claim in Burke, Idaho, called the Hecla. Um, now, the or origin of the name is always going to be a mystery. I, I get this question all the time, what does Hecla mean? Well, it's a, it's a mystery. Does, is it the Icelandic volcano? Is it because uh, of a town in Montana and Michigan and companies with the name Hecla? Um, or was it the foresight of James Toner, the man who staked the claim, having the foresight that it was going to go so deep that it would fulfill the medieval folklore of being at the gates of hell? That's the one that I like. Is <laughs> If you go underground and you feel how hot it is, you sometimes say, you know what, he, he got it right. So the innovation that was happening generally in the world was also specifically happening in mining. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we saw advances that made mining safer and more productive. And in 1903, the changeover from steam to electric power occurred and was immediately adopted by mining companies. It was a huge innovation. And the mines in the Silver Valley were key customers for Washington Water Power, which for those of you that aren't from Spokane, you might not know who that is, but that's a Vista, which is the local utility here that was formed in 1890, so just a year before Hecla. Um, and the mines were really the backbone of a Vista or Washington Water Power being able to uh, develop hydro. And you can see the power lines in the uh, upper right of this photo. There are also improvements in explosives, dynamite instead of black powder and nitroglycerin, stoper drills that relegated the two-man double jack and uh, hand steel to history, and the mining competitions. Uh, they're great fun if you haven't been to a mining competition. But the stoper drill was also known as the widow maker. Its pounding force created clouds of rock that caused emphysema. So drilling was changed to use hollow steel with water flushing the cuttings and almost eliminating the fine dust. Now, fast forward to what we think of as the present. And by that, I mean 
the, really the period of time that most of us in the room have been in the industry. Uh, people characterize the industry as not changing very much, but uh, I'm struck by the changes that have occurred in the industry. You had jumbo drills and rubber tired equipment getting miners off the jack leg, heap leaching allowing extraordinarily low grade minerals to be mined. PLCs and mills allowing even higher metal recoveries balanced with just the right amount of, of, uh, of throughput. And then these monstrous haul trucks and shovels. And when I started, some of the haul trucks we used were 40 short tons. Today they are as big as 450 metric tons. And then there's been the changes in geology and planning. At, uh, at Hecla, we have geologic maps stretching back over parts of three centuries. Most of them painstakingly, time-consumingly, and carefully drawn and colored by hand. They're really works of art. And I think uh, Steve Petroni, the guy that's in the picture, is Steve here? So I think, Steve, do you have some linens? So Steve has some, some linens in the, uh, that, that are going to be at our booth that are well worth your time going to see because they are quite extraordinary. Um, so now, today, we have this computer power that, that really, in a blink of, the, of, a, of an eye, takes all of this data, these, these maps, this information that took a century to compile and puts it into a 3D rotating computer model that really helps us identify uh, where the ore body is, where the best targets are, where to put the adits, where to put the, 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 uh, the pits, uh, and maybe even what the economics might be. And Hecla itself has introduced many in innovations uh, in its history. First, mine to use uh, paste and mine under fill, and we're continuing that tradition. Right now, we're sinking the deepest underground shaft in the U.S., our number four shaft, will put the mine two miles underground. Much of the progress and innovation over the years has sprung from the desire not only for more production but for a safer workplace. And my hardest time with Hecla, my hardest time with the industry came in 2011 when Pete Merrick died in a ground fall at the Lucky Friday. That was that. <laughs> That was that mine's first fatality in 25 years. And we thought we had a very good safety record up to that time, and we did. And we thought we were uh, utilizing best practices, and we were. But it really galvanized us to redouble our efforts. So we became an early and full adopter of the National Mining Association's core safety. It's a program that has taken the insights and programs of the largest mining companies and at no cost has made them available to the industry. And it took our motivation to make Hecla safer and gave us the tools to do it with. And you know, we're given this presentation for a lot of reasons, but one of them is to encourage you, if you're not familiar with core safety, please go to their website, coresafety.org, and you'll be amazed at the information that's available to you and your company to make it safer. And that applies both to an operating company as well as an exploration company. We want everyone in this industry to go home safe every day. Um, we believe that accidents are not inevitable. I get into arguments with my wife all the time as to whether an accident's inevitable or not. We believe that they're not. We believe that you can um, figure out how to engineer the risk out of situations to, in order to make things safer. And we also look at how people act. Are they doing it safe, safely? Are they making the right judgments? Have we emphasized enough that if it's not safe, then you just don't, don't do it? And so it becomes a cultural change, and I can tell you at our, we had a board meeting, and that was one of the issues that we talked about was, was are we doing the things to improve the safety culture at the company? And it's not just the company, but it's also the industry. And the industry has also become forerunners in environmental stewardship over the last few decades. And of course, we've seen lots of n things in the news uh, that are not so good uh, uh, with respect to, uh, to the environmental stewardship. And what that does is it gives environmental activists who collect the public's money 
to oppose our, our operations and the, and the industry in general. But when I look at HECLA and when I think about the industry, we are and need to become even more of active environmentalists, engineering solutions, paying for improvements to actually take care of the land and the environment. And it's this type of thoughtful, innovative planning and use of new technology that allows our Greens Creek mine uh, to operate in a national monument on Admiralty Island in Alaska with a very small footprint. And we work in the middle of the densest population of brown bears in the world. And as an industry, we have to continue to be creative and innovative and figure out how to uh, operate in these sorts of environments if we're going to prosper in the future. So let's think about the future. From 1891 to today, throughout the history of mining, underground miners have been physically attached to the steel. Whether it's been with a hand steel and a double jack, or it's been with the stoper drill or the jack leg, you ha you've had someone physically attached to it. Now you might say, well, we now have jumbos and they're not attached, but they are because they're hands on those, are on those controls, and those controls are connected to the steel and the steels at, at the face. And so when I look into the future, and it's, this is not the distant future, this is within the next 10 to 15 years, I can see underground mining changing in a dramatic way where there is no longer a miner connected to one or two pieces of steel. And why, why is that going to change? And there's really three reasons. The first, as always, economics enters in, into it. It's a force that either causes you to change or creates an opportunity to change. And at the lower commodity prices, we and everyone in the industry are experiencing significant, significantly lower margins. For us, margins are down $25 per ounce or a quarter billion dollars less cash flow a year. So necessity is the mother of invention. The second reason for the dramatic, is the dramatic drop in the coal price uh, that has increased equipment vendors focus on narrow vein hard rock mines. About three years ago, I was at the SME and a well-known supplier said to me, basically, we're just not interested in servicing the sort of mines Hecla, Hecla has, the sort of equipment that Hecla needs for its mines. This has dramatically changed. We now have multiple proposals for machines I'll, I'm going to talk about in a moment. Third, we're using new technology in, in our everyday life, smartphones, tablets, Internet of Things, and I bought a car recently, and that's it, um, that has some great features. And this car will sense the speed of the cars in front of me and slow down without me doing anything right ahead. It, it's a pretty amazing thing. It is, it is, and not only that, but it'll it will stop if I'm going to hit something. Now, to be honest with you, I haven't actually tested that, but... <laughs> now, our million-dollar machines that we have underground, it doesn't have any of this technology. And so, you think about, if it did, maybe you'd be able to drive those machines 5%, 10% faster and increase your productivity. So, what do I envision are the things that will cause a step change in the way narrow-vein underground mines are operated. The first is battery-powered equipment. Imagine going underground in a mine that's quiet with machines that operate cold without any emissions, reducing refrigeration and ventilation requirements, and allowing us to go deeper than we ever imagined. Second, you know about the Google car, you know, the self-driving car. Well, the same thing is happening in a mine where an operator sits at surface and runs four or five machines simultaneously, and when they're not operating the machine, the machine functions autonomously. Third, and this is what's really exciting, is mechanical mining in hard rock mines. Mechanical mining has been extensively used in coal mines for the last 30 years or so, but not in hard rock mines. And this change that's happening is possible because improvements in the rock cutting technology. With mechanical mining, there's no drill and blasting, and what happens is this underground mine turns into a rock-producing factory. And we're going to probably test equipment over the course of the next uh, three or four years at some of our mines. Um, we're certainly visiting and looking at what other people are doing. So with our 
persistence, perspective, and position, we're getting ready for a revolution in the narrow vein underground mining. And, and uh, so it's qu quite exciting at Hecla. Now, in, in, in honor of our Quasqua Centennial, um, we have a short video that puts together uh, a talk that, the, about our past and, uh, and present. So let's take a break. Uh, it's got, you got to be tired already of me talking and listen to the, the video or watch the video. Eighteen ninety one. James Naismith invents the game of basketball. Thomas Edison patents the movie camera. William Wrigley establishes a chewing gum empire. That same year, Patsy Clark, Amasa Campbell, and John Finch formed Hecla Mining Company to acquire and trade mining claims in North Idaho's newly discovered Silver Valley, a district that so far produced more than 1.2 billion ounces of silver. 125 years later, Hecla is the last of the district's pioneer mining companies and the largest primary silver producer in the United States. Maintaining discipline in times of both prosperity and adversity required grit and determination, persistence, an uncompromising commitment to better mining. Hecla advanced techniques that significantly improved mine worker safety. It built the Silver Valley's first circular concrete shaft and perfected the underhand mining technique. Hecla was also the first paste fill operation in the Western Hemisphere, a more efficient way of mining and an early adopter of the dry stack method of tailings management, which minimizes a project's footprint. And today, Hecla is taking the Lucky Friday mine to 10,000 feet below the surface, opening up more than 20 years worth of additional resources. Hecla hasn't just weathered the storms of the last 125 years. It's been shaped by them. The Panic of 1893, the Great Depression, and two world wars tested the company's resolve even as they proved Hecla's commitment both to its mines and to its workers. That dedication, along with Hecla's resolution of its legacy environmental issues, has led to a deep connection between the company and the communities in which it operates. Experiences like these have given Hecla a unique perspective on the issues of today. The securing of 100% ownership of Greens Creek, the construction of Lucky Friday's number four shaft, the purchase of the Casa Berardi Gold Mine in Quebec, the innovative exploration that led to the reopening of the San Sebastian Mine, and the acquisition of Rock Creek, one of the largest undeveloped silver and copper deposits in North America, prove Hecla to be bold in its vision and strategic in its thinking, positioning the company for the future. Today, Hecla is stronger than it's ever been. Long-lived assets in safe jurisdictions the highest proven and probable silver reserves in the company's history, exploration properties and pre-development projects with the promise of organic growth. And it's all driven by 1,300 of the best people in the industry, who together with the Hecla Charitable Foundation work tirelessly to meet local challenges and needs. Persistence, perspective, position. This is the platform that will drive Hecla Mining Company forward. These are the characteristics that will ensure continued longevity, that will enable the company to grow and evolve even more in the present century than it has in the previous two. Communications people tell me you're supposed to say things more than once, so that's, you guys should be, uh, and so in fact, we're gonna have a test. <laughs> so, so take out your phones again, 
And here's the question. According to the video you just watched, which of the following things were innovated by Hecla? Is it A, creation of the jumbo, B, first circular shaft in the Western world, C, first pace fill in the Western world, D, underfill mining method, E, drone videoing of mine sites, or F, creation of dry stack tailings? And you may input more than one answer. In fact, at least two of these are correct, and I would argue that there's three, so vote now. So I'll give a couple of seconds to see what, what happens. Okay, so the correct answer is C and D, the first pace fill in the Western world, and development of the <laughs> That's amazing. You guys are fantastic. <laughs> the underfill method. But I would argue that E is also right. And wasn't that great videoing that was done with this drone that was going around the head frames and all, all over the, the mine? Um, so I, uh, I, I think, uh, I hope you're having fun with these, these surveys. I think it's pretty cool. Apparently you can buy these for what, about 600 bucks for a, for a license per year and do a room this size. So I don't know who these guys are, but they need to give us a cut of the action, I think. All right, we can't help but look back at Hecla's history and wonder what lessons we can learn from the long, Hecla's long life. Now there's a saying in Wallace, among the miners that God looks after drunks, babies, and Hecla. And certainly there's some truth to divine intervention or luck, but let me give you our blueprint for legacy, and some of this is against conventional wisdom. First, continuity of, in management, the board, employees, and a strong culture of being part of the community. Now, Hecla's only had 11 presidents, and if you ignore the f a few that just held the position briefly, uh, the average president of Hecla has served the company 16 years, and I'm sure you've heard of some of my predecessors, James McCarthy, Lou Hanley, Les Randall, Bill Love, Bill Griffith, and of course, Art Brown. I've been the CEO now for 12 years, and with the exciting changes that I see us having and the industry having, I hope to do it, do it a, somewhat longer. Um, I believe long-tenured leaders have given Hecla a sense of direction, continuity, and perspective that you can't create with quick turnovers in management. And the same thing applies to, to our board, who has, on average, a tenure of 11 years. We also have had many people who have worked for the companies 20, 30 years and, or longer, and we just celebrated Gary Fessler's 40th year with the company, and he's still not 60. And we've had generations that have worked for our company, grandfathers, fathers, son, uncles, aunts, cousins. In fact, the picture you see here is of Wink and his son. When people are so committed to a community and to a company, they figure out how to make mines work. And I remember when the price of silver was under five bucks, I visited D Doug Bear, who was working to figure out how to make the Lucky Friday operate because he just didn't want to move. His kids were in school. Um, he was chairman of the school board, so he figured out how to make the Lucky Friday work. And he still lives in the same place, and he's been with the company over 20 years. But I can tell you his career is not neutral. He uh, uh, commutes to and from Mexico and is, is operating our Mexican um, San Sebastian mine. And here's my feeling when it comes to the relationship between a mine and the surrounding community. And this is something that I learned from Luke Russell, our VP of External Affairs, who I'm sure lots of you know. And he, and he said, and, and it, I think it's really true, that a mine's relationship with a community over a long period of time goes through a change. It often starts with opposition, it goes to acceptance, and it finally goes to ownership. And in, in, in all the communities where Hecla operates, the communities own our minds, not on paper, not legally, but our long-lived minds have passed into this ownership phase with the community. And it hasn't just happened. We started the long, with long-lived minds, good people, and then supported their engagement in the community as part-time state legislators, presidents of United Way, members of the Chamber of Commerce, trustees on school boards. We had two different employees who were chairman of two different school, school boards. 
And to provide consistent support in good times and bad, seven years ago we established the Heckla Foundation that has now contributed almost $1.5 million. And we've created programs to keep at-risk kids in school, teacher internships to show them the mining industry, and we've supported our people directly with housing loans, university tuition, family time off when, when necessary. And we've seen a payback in the loyalty of the communities, their willingness to support us when budgets are tight, regulations change, or the media casts us in a bad light. That's how you achieve longevity. You don't do it alone. You gotta have support. And a recent example of our culture is something that Laura mentioned and how we rallied around this promising up and coming mining engineer. And when we got the news five years ago that Cindy was diagnosed, we were uh, devastated. She was uh, very well respected. She was moving up the management ladder um, and we just had uh, just the greatest respect for her and we were, we were really devastated by the news. So what did we do? We provided Cindy with a personal assistant and Hecla people helped her and, it, and, and we did this because she asked to continue to work. She said that she thought that would, would help her and so we, uh, we helped her do that. And then she also became a leader in the fight against ALS and we joined her and we sponsored fundraising events and raised records amount in participation and money. And to honor Cindy, we established a special bike ride in the Silver Valley in June that I would ask you to participate in and I would ask you to just come by our booth to get more information on, on it. And I'm sorry to say that Cindy passed away earlier this year. Very brave, courageous example for all of us. She, is an inspiration, she has made Hecla better. And these are the kind of people and the sense of community that you have to have if you're gonna have a, uh, longevity. The second ingredient for longevity is to plan for a very long future. And this requires tough decisions, risk-taking, good judgment, some failure, and lots of criticism, but it can pay off. An example of this comes from another company um, and, and their Bunker Hill mine. And, Way back in the 1890s, I guess 1893, Bunker Hill began to work on the 12,000 foot Kellogg Tunnel and it took nine years for them to complete it. In the meantime, prices went up, prices went down, there was a financial crisis, there was lots of criticism, but they kept going. They showed the persistence needed for longevity and it paid. The bunker ended up as one of the largest producers of lead and zinc for almost 50 years because of the Kellogg Tunnel. Now today at Hecla, we have embarked on what I consider a similar proposition, the number four shaft at the Lucky Friday. We're sinking the shaft to 8,600 feet below the mine entrance and 10,000 feet below the surface. It's been a 10-year project. It's been the largest capital project in the history of the company. Silver prices were relatively low when it started. They went relatively high. They've come relative, back relatively low. Um, but we've continued to advance the, the shaft because it creates a platform, a platform for mining. Um, it's taken us 20 years to mine about 1,400 feet deeper in the mine. And with this shaft, it's gonna give us access to another 2,500 feet. So we're gonna have decades of production in front of us. In addition to mining, the shaft gives us access to explore and produce, from, and, and this is really for you geologists gives us access to explore and produce from a volume of rock that's two miles deep, two miles radius, uh, which if you do the math, that's 25 cubic miles of potential. And in that potential, there's been half a billion silver ounces already identified, so it's highly prospective ground. And with the higher grades that we're seeing at the Lucky Friday as we go deeper, uh, the more convinced I am that this project sets Heckle up for the next 20, 30, 40 years, maybe even the next 125 years. So we'll, we'll see. Third, you need strong assets to create the base for longevity, and we have them. Now, Greens Creek is in its 28th year of having a 10-year mine life in front of it. It's produced 200 million ounces, and it's got 100 million ounces in reserves. It's generated four billion in revenue, and a billion in free cash flow. This is the sort of mine that a long-lived company has to have if it's, uh, 
if it's going to have that longevity. Lucky Friday is a 70-year mine whose best days are still ahead. Now, this is a picture. This is probably not the picture you would expect to see of the Lucky Friday. It's a picture of a stope. This is the 16 stope at the 6300 level. And what you're seeing there is pure galena, 47% lead, 100 ounce per ton. When they tried to load it in the trucks, the trucks couldn't take the normal sort of load. When they put it in the skip, the skip couldn't take the normal load because this stuff is... It's lead, right? <laughs> now, there's only 50 feet of this that we are mining today, but 1,000 feet below us, that 50 feet grows to 600 feet. Exciting, exciting time for the, for the Lucky Friday. Now, the Casa Berardi mine is a gold mine that's in Quebec, and when I look at the drill results and I look at the economics of the pits that we will be developing, um, I think this could become, and I look at the expiration, this could become another company making mine like Greens Creek, particularly if the Canadian dollar keeps getting weaker. <laughs> San Sebastian is an example of Hecla being flexible though, because we're developing this mine and it has a two-year mine life, but it has a 400 percent internal rate of return. And we're only taking a fraction of the resource, and I think eventually it will be another long-lived mine for us. And then you have Rock Creek. It's our newest asset. It's big. 250 million ounces of silver, 2 billion pounds of copper. The issues with it are environmental, and they're exactly the same issues that we have at, at Greens Creek, where we've been so successful. So expect lots of news about Greens Creek over the next 5 to 10 years. And we have lots of other assets that are, are in a pipeline that take us from exploration to permitting to development to construction or to production. And having that pipeline is also part of what you need for, to have a company that lasts. The fourth element of our blueprint for longevity is a focus on growth, productivity, and costs. This is actually from our investor relations present, presentation. And you know, what we look for is do, when we have a property, does it take our resources, reserves, and production and provide growth? Is it growing or does it have the potential to grow? Is it low cost or does it have the potential to have low cost? You know, our mantra has been we want big prospective land packages, we want low cost, we want long lives. And it's a simple strategy that's been working to deliver value to shareholders over the years. Uh, over the past year, if you look at over the past year, past five years, past ten years, what you'll see is heckless performance of our shares has been in the top quartile uh, relative to precious metals producer. And for thousands of our 72,000 shareholders, we are their primary precious metals holding. And I got a re recently a call from Lee Erdahl. He's a long retired director of Heckler who said, I'm passing my shares onto my grandchildren and telling them to continue to hold them for the long term. Hecla future looks so bright. That comment is from a guy who I consider very shrewd, a guy who's seasoned, and a guy who sees the longevity and value for, for shareholders. So we've, we've looked at the mining industry from a lot of different angles. We've compared the past to the present, what the future holds, a snapshot of what I think gives a company longevity. But what I'd like to leave you with is something to think about on what creates true value and should be the measure of value. And we're going to do this with a super, so we're going to do another survey, a super simplified hypothetical, and we're not going to consider everything. This is super simple, so get your phones out and get ready to vote again. So here's the hypothetical. Assume you have a million ounce gold deposit on a 10 square mile land package that has not been explored with modern exploration methods. And you have two options. You can ha have a mine size produce 200,000 ounces a year or one that is 100,000 ounces a year. So you can have a five-year mine life or a 10-year mine life. The capital costs are the same for both. I, I told you this was super simplified. And the operating costs are the same for, for both and are in the lower quartile relative to the industry but costs will increase 10% per year till mine closure. However, costs never go above the median costs of the in industry. So it's a low cost operation. So here's the question. Would you rather have the mine that produces 200,000 for five years or 100,000 for 10 years? Vote your answer now. 
So A is 200,000, B 100,000. Hmm? So it's actually, surprisingly, fairly evenly split. And in my view, and there's not really a right answer here, and I recognize that, but in my view, um, I like the longer mine life, and that's been part of the strategy at Hecla is to have this larger, this long mine life. Um, but if you look at the industry and the, the, the continuing um, position of folks in the industry, it has been just the opposite. Their view is you maximize NAV, period. Mine it out in five years or faster if you can. Every day I get a report or I have a meeting with an investment banker, banker or an analyst who makes comparison of precious metals company based on some NAV. We are encouraged to buy one another's stock. We're encouraged to merge, acquire companies, develop assets, all based on this consensus NAV. Well, I think this is exactly the opposite of how mining companies deliver value to shareholders. Basically, I think that mine life or duration is the biggest source of value for long-term shareholders. It's not everything, but it is the most important thing in my mind. So why do I say this? First, commodity prices are volatile, very volatile. In fact, if you look at the first 20 years of my career, we saw the price of gold trade from about 260 to, to 500. This is incredible volatility, but if you look at the last 10 years, it's gone from 500 to 1800. And silver has seen even greater volatility. And it would be another talk to explain, explain it, but I think that future volatility is going to be at least as great as what we saw in the first 20 years and probably more like what we saw in the last 10. So a longer term operation has the opportunity to capture that volatility, which I think increases the value of the deposit. Second, you need the longer time frame to understand the geology of a district. If you were listening to me earlier, I said that one of the requirements for a mining company to have longevity is to develop long-term exploration and production potential. And third, it just takes time to make the operational improvements and innovations at an individual operation that will lead to higher productivity, lower costs, and better economics. So those things I talked about, the, the battery-operated equipment, the mechanical mining, if you don't have a long-lived operation, you don't have the ability to even consider those things because you're in such a hurry to um, maximize the, that value in the, in the short term. I think the industry has done itself a disservice for both itself and its shareholders by trying to treat our assets like they're real estate or like a bond. It pressures companies to create the wrong kind of assets to make the wrong sort of, sorts of acquisitions and jeopardizes the future prosperity of our industry. And at Hecla, as hard as it's been, we've attempted to minimize the NAV or the focus on the NAV metrics with an eye to long life geologic potential and operating improvements. While NAV is a metric to consider, it's secondary in our, our mind. Um, we need more of this, in our view, we need more of this sort of thinking to have the industry on the right path. So I'm glad we're kicking off our celebration of our 125th year at the AMA convention. This is an organization that's nearly as old as Hecla. Uh, we had association with them since the very beginning. In fact, we're pretty sure that some of Hecla's founders were also founders of the AEMA. And like, a, like Hecla AMA, AEMA has had a very colorful history over the years, renaming and reinventing itself a number of times. It actually started as the Northwest Mining Association, then it changed its name to the Mining Men's Lunch Club. <laughs> then these, these guys said, no, we are the Mining Men's Club of Spokane. So I guess they went to dinner rather than to lunch. Then, and then they finally went back to the Northwest Mining Association, and of course now we're the American Exploration and Mining Association. In the meantime, there's been several association presidents through the years that have worked for Hecla, and we've had countless numbers of our employees on the Board of Trustees. In fact, you guys honored, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Dean McDonald, for uh, chairing, I guess, the convention and or organizing things. Now, the association has changed itself over time as, uh, as needs dictate. 
In fact, for a long time, not quite to 1993, when I came to my first convention, the Northwest was mainly known for the best and bodiest parties in the industry. And, and we're very grateful today for their latest and long-standing reincarnation as a real advocate for the, uh, the industry uh, in Washington, D.C. And, and elsewhere. And we thank them for that. And they still throw great parties. So Laura, with that, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to make the presentation. <laughs>